Aaron. Yeah, this is Aaron Gancy. Is that how to pronounce your name? Uh -huh. Yeah, so Aaron is a visual communication and user interface designer with expertise in user centered design and he is also assistant professor of visual communication design at Heron School of Art and Design, IUPUI. Uh, the same as Pamela, uh, which everyone already met. Yeah. So, with professional experience in graphic interaction and user experience design, um, Aaron is an expert in both the visual design of digital interface and in translation of user needs into useful, usable, and desirable uh, experiences. He is a frequent consultant on design of the websites and software interface, mostly recently for the IU School of Medicine, so is at Indiana University. Yeah. Yes, and the online computer li library center and the city of Indianapolis. Yeah, so I met um, Aaron this summer um, in Indiana. Yeah, and we had a little talk on, on the course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is how we get to to um, invited Aaron into the class. Yeah. Yeah, glad to be here. Great. You want me to jump in? Yes. Do you okay. have? And you you can see me right now on the screen. Is that right? Yes. So I'll share I'll share my screen. It's up and running. Okay. Now you see slides. Yes. Just need the full screen, I guess. Go okay. Ahead. Oh, do you want me to send it to you? Do you? Yeah. Do you have it? Sure. I'll yeah. I'll do it really yeah. fast. Just do it very fast, and I will share that to the class. While I'm doing that, I can kind of ramble on about um, me, I suppose, and yeah. and what this talk will be about. So, uh, as Lee mentioned, I teach mostly digital design, um, user experience design, interaction design, web design, all those types of things uh, at Heron. And this talk is kind of a distilled version, very quick version of of how of the process that I have my students go through when they are starting to figure out what what they're going to make for a digital product. <clears throat> um, so, sorry, I can't find the file and think and talk at the same time. Uh, okay, I'm sending it to you now. All right. <clears throat> so, I call it designing desirable products. And we're going to talk about what desirability means in a minute. Uh, but first, let's talk about what products mean. Um, if I can get my, there we go. Uh, by digital products, I just mean things that are produced for digital consumption. So websites, software applications, other digital interfaces, things like kiosks or uh, you know, like touch screens that you see in airports, that kind of stuff, um, that help people achieve goals or tasks. Um, the process of, or sort of the breakdown of what I'm going to talk about today is how do you figure out what your product does, how do you make it desirable, and then how do you get started. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what your project is about. If you have a, a certain context you'll be working in. Um, so I'm going to talk broadly about how you might decide what a digital product is. Mm -hmm. So each for us, each team focus on a different topic. Yeah. So their team focus on building a better art and culture scene in Conway, you know, in the city. And okay. their uh, teams are focusing on educating the public about mental health, for example. Yeah. Okay. And there are also a team who wants to make a um, product that make um, kids in elementary school to be more active, for example. Okay, great. So those are perfect sort of scope, scoped levels of um, figuring out, or they're good starting points to figure out what a digital product might be with inside that. Um, so let's dive right in. So what does it do is the first part. And what it does should be based on two things. The primary thing is what do people need to achieve with it? So user need should be the primary driver. Mm -hmm. And I think you're working, the, the stuff you're doing with Pamela's class is a, is about that kind of re user research, am I right? Yes. Okay, all right, so that those kind of activities should, should lead into that. And then also once you define that, you need to find a gap in the marketplace, which just means is there somebody else that's already doing a similar thing out there 
and what might yours do differently or better. Uh, so we'll talk about that. So, so does, uh, does that mean it's fine if you find similar product out there, but you wanted to distinguish yourself from those existing products? Exactly, yes. Okay. Or you want to um, sort of more specialize it for the specific use case yes. you have in mind. Um, and I have an example of that uh, as, we, as we move through. Um, so when you're trying to understand what users need or what people need, um, in user experience design, we tend to think about that through three, a spectrum of three different goals. End goals, experience goals, and life goals. And your product in the end should satisfy all three of these goals. So I have my students go through an exercise of defining these goals and sort of separating them out so they can figure out um, it, you know exactly what the how the product needs to act and what it needs to do. Um, so end goals are what the person literally needs to do with the product. So they need to find new music, order a meal, stay connected with family, cross the street, etc. It's it's the tangible thing of what am I going to accomplish when this is over. Experience goals address how the person wants to feel while they're using that product. So. These are some of the more intangible things that designers can really affect. So I want to feel smart and in control. I want to have fun, feel relaxed, etc. You can imagine um, an online banking platform, for instance, where an end goal is I want to transfer money from one account to another. Mm -hmm. And if you apply an ex different experience goals on top of that end goal, it changes the product drastically. Right. If you want to transfer money from one account to another and remain focused and alert or smart and in control, that's one thing. But if you want to transfer money and have fun, that's a completely different interaction. Uh, and the third one is life goals. And that addresses that's kind of the hardest to nail down, but it sort of addresses why the person why how the how this product fits into the person's broader sense of self self. So I use this. Uh, I use this application because I want to be a good person, I want to succeed, I want to be respected, etc. Uh, these goals come from Alan Cooper, um, and his book is about, about Face, we're, at, we're on the fourth edition of that. If you're interested in these, you can find more um, on that there. Okay, so now you have your goals defined. Once you do that, you need to look at sort of the market. So what else is out there that's doing a similar type of thing that's that's filling this gap in a person's life? Here's a quick example. So if if we're dealing with families who live far apart need to needing to communicate with one another, where are the market gaps there? So we could look at what other products are out there that let families do that. And so you have, you know, just regular texting, chatting, Skype can do that. Um, phone calling, YouTube could be a way to do it, Twitter, Facebook, there's a million different ways, right? But they all have different kind of purposes, um, especially when you build in the experience goal, life goal kind of aspects into them. So what I have my students do is, is a sort of competitive analysis, we call, where you look at the landscape of what else is out there in the area and figure out why it's why it would not why it would or would not work for your target audience. Um, so this is an example of one of my students from last year. I thought he did an exceptionally good job because he's as a visual designer is both breaking down the UI elements. So what about the visual design and then the UX or what what is about the interaction or experience elements of a variety of apps in the space he was dealing with. Um, relationship building. So he looked at at uh, dating apps, Meetup, those kind of things to to see what else people are doing in that in that space. Okay. Once you've figured those couple things out, there are a couple deliverables that can help clarify for you as you move forward what your product needs to do. So one of them is a how might I statement. Have you dealt with those with Pamela yet? Um, are yes. you familiar with those? Yes. Okay. Did this? Yeah. So the how might I statement is really just kind of a starting point for defining what your design is to do and then drafting a persona. And these two things work in tandem. 
So just a little more detail on how might I. So for instance, how might Jane say, stay in touch with her family and feel productive? Right now we're starting to build in some of those experience goals into there. Uh, if that's our how might I, the persona needs to amplify that to clarify who Jane is. Um, and so as you're drafting a persona, um, have you guys dealt with personas before? Yes. We, okay. Yeah, we complete um, five personas for the products. So, oh, great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so one thing I tell, I urge my students to do is not only, f so, so the easy thing to do is focus on a persona through their demographics. So Jane is 23, she lives in uh, Houston, on and on and on, sort of uh, demographic information about her. But you really need to instill things about her motivations inside that persona. So that the persona needs to clarify who that person is in relationship to how they're using your app. Um, yes, that's what I have here. So pers persona should be driven by motivation and need, not only demographics. What are their goals? What's driving their use? And demographics are used to uh, frame the context around you know, the, the sort of use of product. Demographics can also give us information about maybe visual preferences. So if someone is 19, they may have different visual preferences or sort of typographic layout needs than, say, 60-year-olds or 70-year-olds. So that is the persona. Here's an example of one of my students' combination of how might I and a persona. Her product was about working um, improving uh, organizational abilities of uh, young adults with Asperger's syndrome, which is a, a sort of version of um, autism. Uh, so how might I create a tool for young adults with Asperger's syndrome so that they can learn to organize their life in order to become less reliant on their parents? That was her main objective. And then she goes into sort of describing both the young adult and the parent mm -hmm. through their um, through their motivations. Okay, I might pause there and see, I suppose, if there's any questions, because then I'm going to dive into desirability. Are there any questions? <laughs> no? We've done a lot of that. Okay. Yeah, great. We move on. Move up? Okay. All right, so now that you know what products can do, you need to make sure that it is desirable, otherwise people won't want to use it. So I'm going to break down what, what desirability means and sort of how I show my students how to parse out on what you design, all leading back towards desirability. So desirability is a triad of things that... Uh, must be present for the app to be successful. So an app, and I'm using app just as sort of a placeholder, a product, must be useful, usable, usable, and enjoyable. And these are the three categories that I grade my students work on primarily. So once they hand something in, they need to prove to me that their product is useful, usable, and enjoyable. And if one of those things is missing, the app tends to be a weak solution. So let's look at those in more detail. Useful deals with, does the design allow me to actually do the task I have in mind? So can I, um, can I connect with my family, et cetera? Usability um, addresses, does the design consider my abilities and experiences when presenting me with the task? So this is, um, usability is can be a common problem on the web or in apps and those kind of things, and in the real world. Um, if you just think about like a design being sort of convoluted and uh, getting in the way of um, allowing people to complete the task. So sort of like an easy example is a, uh, a door that's labeled push, but you have to pull it open to open it. Right. Make sure your your um, your communication is clear. And last and most, uh, the hardest to 
address is enjoyability. So is the design something that I want to use or keep using in the future? Um, and that's where experience goals, matching experience goals really come into play. So those things start to start to overlap. I have a couple examples here. So here's the triad, useful, usable, enjoyable. The Apple Watch is a good example of something that is uh, usable. I can use it. it the, the features on it are available to me in a way that I understand how to use, although some people might debate it. It is pleasurable or enjoyable because it has this kind of cool factor. There's, um, you know, pay with your watch at, at the grocery store, that kind of thing. It's enjoyable. But right now it's not very useful. Mm -hmm. it doesn't have It doesn't have a lot of things that I literally can't do with it. So it's, it's lacking a little bit there. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this or remember this thing, but Sony tried to make this uh, TV box set that came with this crazy remote. It's useful, right? I can type on it. I can change the channels. I can do all these things. Uh, it is enjoyable um, in that, again, same kind of like uh, issue or sa same kind of thing that's making the Apple Watch enjoyable of like forever I wanted a computer connected to my TV and now I can finally do it and look at all these cool things I can do, uh, but not very usable, right? Like this remote is crazy. Generally all remotes uh, are bad um, in terms of usability, P partially because they're trying to do too many things. Uh, and this is my favorite example of enjoyability. Um, if you're a baseball fan like me, this player uh, got hit in the head with a line drive. He's a pitcher and got a concussion. So he, had, he has to wear a protective hat at all times uh, because if he gets another concussion, con you know, concussions are additive. So the more you have, the more likely you are to be seriously injured or you know, even potentially die. Um, so this hat is is usable, it's useful, but not very enjoyable to wear, right? Like it looks really goofy to wear this giant hat. It makes his head look tiny. Um, so just two examples of where things, uh, w how weaknesses in those areas reveal themselves. Quick example. I, I'm, again, so, so another example, the same thing. If we're talking about designing a photo app, so now to take photos, if you can preview a picture that you might take, but not actually be able to take the picture, that is not useful, right? If you need to take a picture, but in order to do it, you have to tap the screen really fast, uh, that's not very usable, right? Because you're going to shake the phone and the camera, the picture's not going to come up. And that action is kind of hidden. Um, and then if you can take as many pictures as you want, but you can't show them to anyone else, that's not very enjoyable, right? One of the, one of the key things about taking pictures is so that you can show other people what you did or what you saw. Instagram is a good example of an app that satisfies all three. It's a very it's usable, useful, and enjoyable experience. All right, so now how do you get started? So you've got, you figured out what the app is going to do, have an idea of how you might make it desirable, uh, but what do you do to get started? So before you start at getting anywhere near high fidelity, meaning like sort of polished visual design, um, you need to figure out what, what the core functionality of your product is and what the workflow is. So, so how does the person go through step by step by step to achieve? goal or their task. And there are two ways to go about doing this. What I have my students start with is storyboarding or workflow uh, mapping. And then after that, go through a process of what I call low and fast prototyping. This is the bulk of, of their work. So we don't get into high fidelity design until say the last maybe 20% of the project. Um, so some examples of storyboarding. This is an easy way, sort of graphical way, to tell the story of how a person interacts with your product. So, sort of glossing over some details of the of the UI design or UX design, but really addressing how does the person, 
what's causing the person to need to use your product? How do they start using it? What do they do to go throughout it? And then sort of how do they exit it? And um, here's one example. It's another. These can be, they do not have to be highly polished storyboards. It's, it's just a way for you to uh, get it out on paper and to sort of think through everything that the app needs to do. Some students that are really good at drawing end up using these in their final documentation to explain, um, you know, how, how the, what the app does uh, fits into somebody's life. Then once you have that down, um, you go through a process of low and fast prototype, which just means you work at a low fidelity very quickly. Uh, so here's, this is just from this semester, uh, students working on, <clears throat> um, a, their problem space is uh, how, how, do, how can we enable students to eat lunch on our campus or at our school is really complicated or um, not enjoyable process right now. Uh, so she's working on this thing where you can kind of fold down this uh, tray out of your car and uh, do, do a bunch of other stuff um, in the car because that's really one of the only places there is to eat. Um, but really low sketches just to get ideas across, a lot of labeling, um, and then talking through with either me or her colleagues, student colleagues, to figure out, is it working? At this point, you're just trying to figure out what, what are all my options and what's going to work? What, what do I think is going to work the best? So for applications, that ends up like wireframes, um, very simple, no, no visual aesthetic text, black uh, boxes, et cetera, to just get content out there and, and figure out if it's, um, if it's what I need to be showing. Here, uh, this student, again from this semester, is working on the language that the, or sort of the tone that the app uses to talk to, uh, to the user. So he's really just working through what are the, what are the messaging, what is the messaging that I'm showing um, as, the person goes through that is he wants it to be a very kind of friendly personable experience again sketches these are uh, drone sketches they're trying to figure out how to deliver food through with a drone and how that actually works I think what was nice about this is um, this student is thinking about how the how the drone opens it's a, it's a very critical moment of the interaction is if this drone comes and lands in front of you uh, it's kind of going to freak you out with this, like a flying saucer kind of thing. It's going to land in front of you, and it needs to be very approachable once you get there. So he's thinking about these details, um, details kind of in isolation, and then uh, thinking about the bigger picture separately. And once you start to get to a, a place where you think um, you can tell a complete story through your designs, meaning you can go through a, through all the tasks to complete the goal, you should put those low-fidelity prototypes in front of somebody. So this is a good way that my students often use is just paper prototyping, um, kind of print out the, the app screen, and then ask somebody to go to go through it and to actually act like they're tapping it. If they tap on a new screen, you lay that screen down, and then you can have the person kind of comment about what they what the issues they had um, as they were going through, or if they had questions or difficulties or mm -hmm. whatever throughout. Okay, and then I have just a couple examples of some other projects that my, have stu my students have worked on in this area. Uh, and I'm going to talk about these and then sort of show a couple of examples of how I would suggest you document these designs in the end. So this is that community building or relationship building app that I talked about earlier. Um, it was called Niche, and he... He is doing what I suggest, um, which is to only design the screens that are necessary to tell your story. So this, this is into the high fidelity. Uh, high fidelity, of course, takes the most time. So you only, you want to design the screens that best tell your story. So there's sort of critical moments of the interaction. Um, here is a food truck finder. Uh, so again, he's showing a state of 
that's critical to the moment. The idea here is you can slide uh, to, to their plan in the future or eat the meal right now. Um, this is an app. This was a project that was about sharing or um, sorry, selling things. Uh, it, so you own something and then you want to sell it. And so she made this kind of um, uh, like a digital garage sale, basically. So very easy to post something and then um, have some have people come find uh, find it and take it off your hands for you. Sort of a streamlined Craigslist. But what those don't show us, those last couple that I just showed, they look good, right? They look very polished, but they don't tell us why the design is successful in terms of desirability. So they they look good, that's that's a desirable factor, but we don't really know anything about who's using it or why they would use it through those just static mocks. So when you document this, or what I have my students do when they document it is um, to call out key features of the design that help explain those elements. So you're making, you should be making intentional decisions, design decisions as you're working, and you want to make sure that that the rest of us understand why you made those decisions, basically. So you, you know everything down to why did I choose this this icon set. Why did I choose these colors or this layout, et cetera, should all be based on those earlier goals and um, the desirability I had that I talked about earlier. There's one example and another. Just to, so, so basically, you know, I have them do it. You could talk through, the app through a couple of static screens, and then you go into more detail by just calling out details uh, within what you, what you see there. Okay, so to recap, uh, what I talked about was first how to identify what your app does. And to do that, you need to find a real person and, and identify if there's a market gap or what the market gap is. Then defining your persona and their goals will help you get started and also inform um Designing a desirable product, which is, remember, useful, usable, and enjoyable. I recommend starting with the storyboard to help you just figure out what everything your app needs to do or what the story is that you need to tell about your product. Uh, work low and fast, and then explain your designs in the end. Okay, time to get started. Uh, here's my email address if you um, ever want to ask me a question or you know, I'm open to, if you want to get feedback on something, of course, you can get in touch. And uh, these are my students that I showcase their work through the mm -hmm. presentation. Yeah, so, um, Aaron, you said that the student only designed the area, the part that, um, that shows the main feature. Does that mean they don't have to... I mean, like, sometimes I know it's important not to repeat, you know, certain design if it, they have the same... If they have same functionality, but uh -huh. does that mean that you only need three or five pages out of that, or you still want them to design the whole app, like in terms of? Well, like well, okay. So it it depends. So um, if the exercise is to just sort of get comfortable with uh, with designing the nuts and bolts of an of a user interface, then we'll then we'll go into designing all of you know all of the pages that we have time to design as many as we can basically but what I try to avoid is um, let's say with the uh, that the niche app that I showed about the result relationship building um, to use that app you have to have a profile but it's not very interesting or it doesn't really add much to the story to show this profile create a new profile screen, you know, because it's, create a new profile is pretty standard activity. Um, okay. There's not much innovation happening there. So it's the screens that address the, the, the heart of the goals, I would yeah. say. Would, the students usually end up designing, um, I don't know, anywhere from, depending on the scope of the app, anywhere from five to 12 screens. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, I also see that your student that's working on a sketch does not look like a app to begin this. So do you not refine, like define what, what kind of interface that they're going to designing for to begin with the project? So they can do anything, like say even industrial, right? Like uh -huh. design for, for. Yep, yeah. and that's um, that is. Uh, part of this project so we teach right now we teach this um, the, the, the projects that I showed are taught in context of a service experience course um, so we, we talk about service design and then we break the service down into individual interactions mm -hmm. and sometimes those interactions are physical um, so that they're both digital and physical things uh, yeah and then it, it gets kind of interesting when students get really interested in in kind of physical industrial design uh, product design because I certainly am not an expert in industrial design mm -hmm. but the process is similar and generally what the, the um, take I have is if you can if you can sell it um, I'm okay with uh, with you dealing with industrial design basically mm -hmm. okay okay I got it but the, the principles carry over right like it's just a di it's just a physical thing instead of a digital thing. So it's interesting that, um, say, we have one group of the student working on making kids, you know, to be more active um, in terms of sports, probably, yeah. But uh, because the whole class, uh, I want the class to be able to involve into the user experience design that I require design an app for it. Um, so the student came across this difficulty of saying, oh, we want kids to be active. Now we are designing an app, you know, for this topic. Oh, yeah. So is that... Um, you know, like, do you, does your class or any of the contacts that the student have encountered, um, you know, facing similar dilemmas at all? Um, yeah, for sure. For sure, in the in the class that I teach right now, which is we just call it designing people centered experiences. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, th that should be part of the conversation. So the the design should be the design should be tailored to the user need. Um, and not necessarily to um, is because that student might want to design an app, for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. I would encourage them to either look for a place in the interaction that an app makes sense, or design something that is um, you know is tailor made for for the context. So in that case, maybe an app is not an app might be part of it, but the, it sounds like they're we might there might need to be some kind of um, physical or tangible mm -hmm. element to it. So it means that probably the 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 kit itself might not be the user, but they can be the the end <clears throat> result where the app can lead into you know to make them more active. Yeah. Yeah. So sure. There, absolutely. Yeah. yeah there yeah. is there are different user groups that that yeah that this uh, group can can focus on. Yeah. Okay. Um. All right. I think. That's all of my questions. Yeah, do you guys have anything in terms of your personal, you know, like the project related to your topic that you wanted to ask for? Yes, that's it. Yeah, I think everyone, yeah, it's pretty clear. Yeah, everyone.